This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. From blacklisting Chinese companies to imposing audit oversight rules, financial ties between Beijing and Washington are under strain. We have to find a mechanism, right, to make sure that companies are prevented from disclosing uh, inaccurate information. A landmark moment, higher, debuting on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Two years later, the London Stock Exchange welcomes China Pacific Insurance Group. What more can we expect? Zurich is another uh, competitor in this area. We feel good about that. China's financial reforms. Why did China choose not to relax the pace of its reforms in a year of coronavirus uncertainty? So to be sure, I mean, just the, the capital market is just too important to be shut down, yeah. uh, to be slowed down. Plus, a message of cooperation. Let me just ask well, I mean, add sort of one thing, if you can add it into yeah. it. There's a great opportunity for U.S. and China to cooperate and then uh, for both countries to prosper. Meet Dr. Feng Xinghai, Vice Chairman of the China Securities Regulatory Commission, only on BizTalk, only on CGTN. Welcome everyone to BizTalk, I'm Michael Wong. Today we take a deep dive into China's financial ties with the United States and Europe. We'll also explore the implications of the latest reforms in opening up measures driving China's capital markets. To discuss all of that and more, we are joined in the studio by Dr. Feng Xinghai, Vice Chairman of the China Securities Regulatory Commission, or the CSRC. Dr. Feng, thank you so much for your time. Welcome to this talk. Mm, good to be here. Great to have you here. Well, frictions between China and the United States have evolved from just focusing on trade to now a wider range of issues, which now include tensions in financial ties between the world's largest and second largest capital markets. Can China and the United States manage their differences and seek common ground? Or will the gaps in perspectives deepen misunderstanding? Let's take a look at this first before we begin our conversation with Dr. Fong. U.S. President Donald Trump signs into law the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act. Chinese companies will be forced off American exchanges in three years unless U.S. regulators can review their financial audits. While it applies to any foreign company, the bill's sponsors say their goal was aimed squarely at China. Recently, global index compilers announced the removal of a number of Chinese stocks under U.S. pressure. Uh, so that is one way to try to cut them off from access to American capital. But despite Washington trying to dissuade investors from holding Chinese stocks, investor demand for Chinese companies listed in the U.S. jumped to a six-year high in 2020. Chinese stocks, both listed at home and abroad, also outpaced global stocks in a volatile 2020, making up over 30 percent of all market cap gains, according to S&P, versus 16 percent compared to its global peers. Capital is global. Barring Chinese firms from the United States will not be the solution. So, Dr. Fong, give us your thoughts first on the Trump administration now signing into a law, a move that could potentially delist Chinese companies from U.S. stock exchanges in three years' time if they don't comply with audit oversight rules. It's an issue has, uh, which has been there for some time. The problem is that U.S. Uh, auditors, auditor inspectors, namely the PCAOB, have not been able to come to China to examine the audit paper of Chinese listed companies in the U.S. And uh, I work for the CSRC, and the CSRC, actually under my leadership in this area, has been uh, trying to find a solution uh, between the U.S. and China for some time. And uh, we have every intention to solve this problem with them, and it is not a very difficult problem to solve. Now, unfortunately, uh, our U.S. friends don't seem to be interested in solving this problem, but then they turn around to pointing to this problem, saying, uh, ha-ha, you know, this is the reason for the law uh, mm. to be passed. I don't know exactly what is the motivation behind that, but I can say that uh, it is you know, self-sabotaging uh, for the United States. And further, you know, these Chinese companies, um, 
they have alternatives, right? You know, they can come back to Hong Kong, they can yeah. come back to Shanghai, and they can list in London nowadays, right? right? So uh, I think uh, the US, you know, our US friends have to think about that as well. But are talks still going on between the CSRC and the US SEC, the PCAOB? Because uh, the CSRC have been speaking with your counterparts in the US for quite some time about this. But now that this legislation is signed into law, where do we stand in terms of the talks? Right now, because of the transition in the US government, mm. Uh, we are not talking uh, to the PCLB nor the SEC at this point regarding this issue. Uh, we made our latest offer to them in the middle of August. The offer is about how we can solve this problem, right, the inspection problem. Yeah. And uh, they have not responded yet. And since then, we have not talked uh, to them. We stand ready to solve that problem uh, with them. And like you mentioned, even if Chinese companies do not list on U.S. stock exchanges, they could list at home, for example, in Hong Kong and also now in London. So it doesn't mean if Chinese companies don't list in the U.S., they'll be barred away from American capital because American investors can simply invest in these cities where Chinese companies are listed. Yes, that's, that is also true. Um, now, of course, you know, uh, there's a follow-up, right? You know, the, the Defense Department in the United States has listed some Chinese companies which they think uh, uh, that U.S. investors should not invest into, mm. right? But this is another issue. But coming back to the you know, our original issue, you're right. Uh, U.S. investors can still invest into Chinese companies. They just uh, have to invest uh, uh, into uh, a company listed in another exchange, not in a U.S. exchange, right. right? Because Chinese companies have returned quite a bit. A lot of Chinese companies, since listing on U.S. stock exchanges, have returned double, triple, quintuple even, and more in terms of total returns for U.S. investors. That's true, yeah. yeah. I want to talk about the co-sponsors of this bill, Dr. Bong, because the senators who co-wrote this bill, mm. they say that Chinese companies listed on U.S. Uh, stock exchanges uh, have cheated have exploited U.S. investors. So obviously some very harsh words being thrown out here. What do you think about this characterization? What's your mm. response? Well, we have about 200 companies listed in the, in the United States, right? Mm. Uh, maybe one or two uh, have had uh, dishonest information disclosure. Right? This is actually uh, quite normal among listed companies uh, around the world. You know, some U.S. companies also right, uh, disclosed yes. you know, yeah. inaccurate information. Uh, but I'm not, you know, trying to argue for a, a company that has, you know, misled uh, the investors, right? Mm. So, so it's not, you know, some kind of you know, huge problem, right? But it is a problem, and the most important thing is that we have to find a mechanism, right, to make sure that companies are not allowed, right, are yeah. prevented from disclosing. Uh, inaccurate information. The U.S. Uh, blacklisting certain companies saying that global investors should not invest in these companies and as a result uh, global index compilers have removed some Chinese companies from their benchmarks. What do you think about that? Again, you know, this seems to me uh, is to make a, a political statement mm. uh, on behalf of the United States. You know, the, the reason that they use, the excuse, let me say it this way, is that, uh, that these companies, according to them, have uh, close links with Chinese militaries, right? Mm. And therefore, U.S. Uh, investors uh, should not be allowed to invest into these companies. I think some of the reasons are very uh, tenuous. You know, they're not very strong because you, you think about an economy which in China is kind of interlinked economy, right? Yeah. Uh, you can almost point to any company and say, you know, this company is linked to, uh, to the military, right? And as a result, of course, the index providers have to remove some of the companies from their indexes because the investors who use the index are not allowed, according to the U.S. law, right, mm. to put their money into these companies. Right? But they're still following these indexes. So the index providers have to remove these Chinese companies from uh, these index. Uh, but the impact so far actually is very minimal. International institutional investors' enthusiasm of investing to Chinese companies have not been affected at all. Mm. So since the executive order, which you know, caused all these delisting uh, from the indexes, since that order was issued in the middle of November, we have witnessed a continued inflow and even increased inflow of foreign capitals into the Chinese stock market. Yeah. We have close to 200 billion RMB uh, foreign capital flowing into our Asia market. Wow, yeah. okay. Do you think Chinese companies will still view the United States as 
a relatively attractive destination to raise capital? Or do you think because of just the atmosphere right now, the increased regulatory scrutiny, it's becoming increasingly cost prohibitive for them to do that? In the U.S., you know, there are certain long-term investors who are very good at identifying values in certain types of companies, right? The internet mm. company, you know, the IT company and so forth. So the U.S. market remains an attractive market for Chinese uh, issuers. Yeah. But as a result of all these um, laws and executive orders, um, I think it, the U.S. will become a less attractive market mm. for Chinese companies relative going to now. forward relative mm. to now. Mm -hmm. And also alternatives, alternative listing venues are developing real quickly. You know, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, yeah. and London. You know, we recently have uh, two companies listing their uh, global deposit receipts mm. in London instead of in New York. Yeah. Right? So you know, there's international competition for good companies. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much, Dr. Fang, for your perspectives sure. on this. We're going to come back to you in just a second. So again, despite the tensions that we see, U.S. financial institutions are indeed stepping up their presence here in China. They're putting geopolitics aside to seek the long-term opportunities this market presents, and China welcomes them. Now, China's stance towards the United States has been of maintaining dialogue and cooperation to seek common ground while reserving differences. And I certainly believe that applies to financial ties as well. All right, time now for a short break. When we come back, we'll discuss with Dr. Fang the state of play in market ties between China and Europe. Three hundred sixty degree profiles of industry movers and shakers, tech mavericks, and policymakers. We drill down on their success. We ask how they set strategy and how they navigate in an increasingly competitive market. Real talk, real business. Join the conversation. Biz Talk. Only on CGTN. Now, with growing trade and investment between China and Europe, there are ample opportunities for financial ties to deepen. Before we continue our conversation with Dr. Fang on that, let's take a look at this. China and the EU enjoy one of the world's biggest and most dynamic economic relationships. In 2020, China became the EU's largest trading partner for the first time. When it comes to investment, a majority of European companies say that China remains a top three destination. From the Shanghai London Stock Connect program to European cities competing to become offshore RMB hubs, from strong demand for China's euro denominated bonds to China EU cooperation in financial governance, financial infrastructure, and monetary coordination. Growing trade and investment ties means the potential for deeper China-Europe financial integration remains strong. And China is forging ahead to make it easier for foreign investors to participate in the country's green finance market. Beijing also co-chairs a working group on setting global sustainable financial standards in the EU-led international platform on sustainable finance. Dr. Fang, so China and the EU, both bank financing-led economies, both want to improve their capital markets. Are there synergies to be had between the two sides? Yes, certainly. You know, uh, Europe, um, by Europe I also mean uh, uh, including uh, England. They have a lot of uh, long-term institutional investors. Yeah. Where do they find you know, fast-growing companies to invest in? Hmm. Uh, it's in China. There are a lot. Yeah. Right? And China is a high-saving economy, but we do not have a lot of good long-term investors. We have a lot of short-term investors in our uh, markets. A lot of retail investors. Yes. So mm. we need you know, to open up our market to European long-term investors. Mm. So that's one thing. Secondly, Chinese companies uh, would always want to have a, an access to international capital markets as well. And they used to all go to the United States, right? Yeah. But given all these tensions, they are now increasingly turning to Europe as well. For the European exchanges, uh, you know, they don't have enough listings, and, but they have good capacity. So they welcome Chinese companies as well. So there's a natural 
uh, cooperation between Europe and China in capital markets. Speaking of cooperation, Dr. Fung, what about the China-EU mm. bilateral investment deal? How is that going to affect financial cooperation between uh -huh. the two sides? The BIT between EU, uh, EU and China would uh, open up investment uh, markets in Europe and China to each other's investors much wider, mm. uh, which means that uh, China can attract a lot more uh, EU investors into not only our uh, portfolio market, but also direct investment market. The China-EU BIT, whatever terms that will be settled in that agreement, it will apply to uh, other countries as well. Mm. And uh, so countries like US and Japan, they also stand to gain from uh, the BIT between China and Europe. A key step that China took to open up its capital markets even more occurred in 2019, and Europe was sort of at the heart of it, the Shanghai London Stock Connect program mm -hmm. launched mm -hmm. then. And this is not just about increasing financial ties between China and the UK, but with Europe overall. Yeah. Obviously, it's still early days for this scheme, launched only in 2019. But how do you see the Stock Connect program developing? It's actually developing quite nicely. You know, uh, we have had four companies, uh, Chinese companies, listed in uh, London, uh, mm -hmm. raising altogether about uh, uh, 5 billion US dollars already. And uh, we are now in the process of working to allow UK companies to list in Shanghai as well. When they have a listing in Shanghai, they can raise IMB directly. And secondly, the valuation in the Shanghai market is much higher actually yes. than in London, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so if you talk about in the, if, the world-class pharmaceutical companies like uh, AstraZeneca, right? in London they can get you know 20 times PE or the most 30 times. In Shanghai they can get 40 times, 50 times PE, yeah. right? So it's very attractive for them to raise uh, funds as well. Yeah, via China depository receipts. Yes. And CDRs. Yes. CDR. Okay. What about Brexit, Dr. Fung? Uh, with the UK now out of the European Union. How do you think London is affected in terms of an attractive destination for Chinese companies to raise capital? Before the UK exit to, to the, uh, the EU, London was almost the only uh, place that Chinese companies uh, thought about mm. because all the, U, the EU uh, institutional money, they invest into London right, yeah. as well. But once London is out, and there may be some kind of you know, boundaries between uh, the EU and the UK, it will make sense for Chinese companies to seek access to uh, either Paris you know, or Frankfurt. Yeah. So in that sense, the, um, uh, London will face some competitions. Are you seeing that maybe a little bit already in terms of other European cities on the continent? Just taking away some thunder, like you mentioned, Paris, Frankfurt, perhaps even Zurich, Luxembourg. Yeah. Especially when it comes to competing for an offshore R&B hub. Frankfurt is very interested in uh, attracting Chinese companies. Uh, mm. and in fact, we have two or three companies that are already listed in, uh, in Frankfurt. Yeah. Uh, Zurich is another uh, competitor in this area. And uh, uh, we feel good about that. You know, we, uh, we welcome you know, these other European cities to try to attract Chinese companies to go there as well. All right, Dr. Fang, thank you for your thoughts on this. Stay with us. And time now for another short break. On the other side, we'll get Dr. Fang's thoughts on where we stand in China's capital market reforms and how China's financial markets will open up even more to the world. That and much more ahead. Three hundred sixty degree profiles of industry movers and shakers, tech mavericks and policymakers. We drill down on their success. We ask how they set strategy and how they navigate in an increasingly competitive market. Real talk, real business. Join the conversation. Biz Talk, only on CGTN. Now, in recent years, we have seen reforms in China's financial sector accelerating, its capital markets becoming more connected with the world and its financial regulators keeping a more forward-looking and watchful eye over potential risks. Now, China's financial markets have now become too big, the catalysts of opportunity too many for any international investor to ignore. So what kinds of reforms are China undertaking right now in its financial markets, and what does China hope to achieve in these reforms? Our chat with Dr. Fang Xinghai, Vice Chairman of the CSRC, continues. But first, 
a look at this. China's commitments to further opening up its financial markets remained on track despite uncertainties from the coronavirus. The country now seeks to fully implement a registration-based IPO system after rolling it out on the technology and innovation-focused Star Market and Chinext board. 2020 saw China lifting foreign ownership caps on futures, securities, asset management and life insurance companies. Foreign banks were given the green light to simultaneously establish branch offices and subsidiaries. The milestone moves in China's financial markets provide ample opportunities for both domestic and foreign financial institutions to thrive in a growing and dynamic capital market. So Dr. Fung, why did China choose not to slow down the pace of its reforms and its financial market opening up in a year of a pandemic? The capital markets is perceived Right. It's considered as a key channel to uh, form for capital to be formed and, and channeled into uh, uh, the real economy. Mm. So uh, it's too important to slow down, to be slowed down. Yeah. When the pandemic was raging in China, we decided to open the capital markets uh, and you know resuming trading as well as IPO. And uh, we did not even stop uh, our reforms, yeah. which is uh, you know the, the what we call the registration system for IPOs. Uh, so in in Shenzhen, for example, uh, this year we implemented you know this registration system in what they call the the, NAS, the, the original Nasdaq you know, of the Chinese uh, market. Of course, you know fortunately today with all these information technology, uh, amazingly capital markets can function without people seeing each other. Right? Yeah. So. Previously, when you do a you know IPO, you have to do this roadshow, what we call it, and yeah. so you physically go to an investor and then you present you know your company to the investor. Uh, today, you you do it online, right? Yeah. And the effect is just as good as going to see them, going mm. to see uh, your investor. So as a result of all these you know reform, as well as um, uh, the uh, continued opening up of the capital markets in China. We have had a bumper year in our capital markets this year. 396 companies uh, listed in China this year, mm -hmm. and they raised a total of 470 billion RMB mm. uh, in capital. And that would put China uh, number two in the world, uh, only after the United States. Gotcha. Both the number as well as the uh, capital raised. Uh, in China, it's uh, it's uh, one of the highest in uh, the last ten years in, in China. Yeah, and so capital markets have contributed uh, quite significantly to this year's good performance of the China's economy. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Dr. Fung registration-based IPO system. So yes. when we talk about China's capital market reforms for the next five years, that's going to be one of the main focuses, as well as creating a fully functioning delisting mechanism mm -hmm. and increasing the proportion of direct financing mm. in China's economy. Talk to us about why these moves are so significant mm -hmm. for China's context. Previously, in order to make sure that a listed company uh, is a good company, right? Mm -hmm. you know, uh, the regulators sitting in CSRC basically had to kind of sift through all the papers, you know, of the listed uh, of the company that intended it to list, right? yep. and try to judge that this is a good company. Uh, that process is quite long, yep. so that slowed down the pace of listing. So for a long time, we had a long queue of companies queuing up to list, and then investors don't have enough new companies to invest into. So the registration system solved that problem. Companies will be allowed to list as long as they disclose sufficient information about their company. And the CSRC's job is to make sure that this information disclosure is accurate, complete, and up to date. Yeah. And that's it. So this is the whole idea. Investors would be more, less, you know, have to be responsible for their own investment uh, judgments, mm -hmm. and then companies are only uh, required to disclose, you know, uh, sufficient information. So that greatly speeded up the process of listing, uh, as well as uh, 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 allowing investors to make more investment into these companies. Yeah, and I think that's behind. You know the uh, uh, number of listed companies, the, the good number of listed companies this year, uh, as well as the amount of money raised. And uh, so far, all the listed companies have not, uh, you know, had a major problem of say uh, inaccurate information disclosure, for example, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, which means that the CSIC actually is doing a quite good job in terms of ensuring right, yep. proper information disclosure. And, uh, but of course, you know, this is a new process in China. Investors still have to uh, learn right, from uh, their mistakes, uh, if they make any. And then underwriters, uh, you know, the underwriters have to make sure that uh, uh, issuers uh, disclose ample and uh, complete information. And then accounting firms are charged with the task of making sure that the financial information disclosed by a company is accurate. Yeah. And if they don't do a good job that, uh, in these things, uh, people, you know, at CSRC, we at CSRC uh, will punish them. Uh, Got it. Yeah, they will either be fined money or sometimes their license will be removed as well. Mm. But what about the pace of these reforms, Dr. Fong, especially when it comes to fully implementing the registration-based IPO system? Because now it's on the star market, it's on the China X, but in terms of rolling it out mm. uh, across the country, because when you think about reforms, oftentimes you could think about entrenched mindsets, it could be a little bit slow, but what do you think about the pace of these reforms specifically? Well, I think there's a consensus at this point that the two reforms that we've done, you know, uh, one in Shanghai, the other in Shenzhen, have been a success. Mm. And we are now in the process of uh, assessing uh, which part of the reform you know, of, the, of, of the whole process still needs to be improved more. Yeah. Right? So for example, uh, uh, underwriter's capability needs to be improved a little bit more. Mm -hmm. right? So we are now assessing you know, when uh, the reform should be rolled out into the entire market, right? the main board, you know, the small medium-sized board as well. Now, our government has mandated that in the next five years, this thing has to be done. Right. right? Uh, so uh, it will be done, and I'm sure it will uh, be done in less than five years. Got it. Okay. A great vote of confidence there. Sure. Let me just ask and add sort of one thing, uh, if you can, if you can add it into yeah. it, and that is, you know, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. before I came back to China. Right. I think uh, uh, there's a great opportunity for U.S. and China to cooperate and then uh, for both countries to prosper. Somehow for certain you know, Americans, they kind of view China as, um, as a huge competitor, right? as, yeah. uh, as someone that, you know, uh, 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 that would kind of take away you know, uh, uh, businesses from U.S. companies. Right? Uh, so they view China somehow as sort of an, a threat to the U.S.'s uh, economy, which is completely wrong. You know, many uh, Americans respect Warren Buffett very much, right? And uh, I respect him as well. And when he was asked about U.S.-China economic relation, maybe just a year ago, you know, and he had this great answer, you know, so I want to repeat his answer. He said, you know, if we have, you know, two views of the world, right? One view is that only the U.S. prospers. China right, does not. Mm. The other view is that both countries prospers, yeah. right? Which world is better, right? Yeah. I mean, it's obvious, you know, if both countries prosper, uh, that world uh, is much better. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a great answer, right? Yeah. Now I used to work for the World Bank, right? The IMF is right uh, across the street from the World Bank. The entire international economic cooperative system, without the U.S. and China working together, that system is not going to work very well. Yeah. And that will have very, very negative consequences for all the developed countries. Exactly. And even for some you know, developed countries yeah. as well. You know. I, I wish we could do an entire episode <laughs> on this, Dr. Fong. Lots to talk about, but yeah. we're a bit yeah. short on time. Thank you so sure, much for your sure, thoughts sure. on this. I would love to talk to you again next time. Great. Yeah. Great to welcome you back again sure. soon. And that wraps up our conversation with Dr. Fang Xinghai, Vice Chairman of the China Securities Regulatory Commission. Indeed, lots to look forward to when it comes to China's capital market reforms and financial cooperation between China and the world. Thanks for joining us on this edition of BizTalk. We'll see you again next time.